Well, I'd like to thank all of you for, for coming in from the hallway. I know at events like this, you get so many uh, great benefits from just the networking. So thanks for taking the time to come in. Uh, when I was asked to, uh, to moderate this panel, I was very excited because from where I sit, I get a great opportunity to see some really exciting things happening across Virginia. And the things that get me most excited in this workforce space are partnerships. Um, and conversations and engagement um, with employers and businesses like you see here today. So I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, first in the center is Lane Hopkins. Lane's the Senior Vice President, Human Resources and Chief Diversity Officer for Capital One. Thank you for being here. Also a member of the Virginia Board of Workforce Development, one of our, our newly appointed members. Um, she is the Senior Vice President of Enterprise Human Resources and the Chief Diversity Officer for Capital One. Uh, she leads the Fortune 500 companies' corporate benefits, compensation, diversity and inclusion, HR operations, recruiting, talent acquisition, and talent management programs. I don't know how you fit that on your business <laughs> card. Um, she also oversees Cap One's recruiting team, um, which annually hires and onboards thousands of associates globally, um, many of them here in Virginia. We're looking forward to benefiting from her experiences and learning more about that. She leads the award-winning Cap One University, which provides training, learning, and development for all associates. Under her leadership, Capital One was ranked number nine on Training Magazine's top 125 companies for employer-sponsored workforce training and development. Um, and I'll just pause here, because I think it's important to note it. When we talk about the workforce system, we, also, we often talk about the public side. I really do recognize and appreciate the work that all these employers do to develop talent within their own organizations, and many of the businesses here also have that commitment, and that's the partnership. Mark DeBoard on the end, uh, Vice President of Human Resources, Client Services for Altria. Vice President of Human Resources, he's responsible for providing human resource support to Altria Group and its companies um, in the areas of client services, labor relations, safety, health, and environmental matters. He currently serves on the Board of Directors of Higher Achievement, a nonprofit organization um, that, as many of you know, provides middle school children from underserved areas um, year-round educational enrichment opportunities. And I know many of their associates are very involved in that. And this helps prepare those students, obviously, for better placement in uh, high school. So thank you for your commitment there. Um, and then finally, Bill Murray, uh, Managing Director, Public Policy and Senior Advisor um, Dominion Resource Services. So when you heard the governor talk about energy, um, Bill here represents a very, very interesting and important company in Virginia. Um, Dominion's a Fortune 200 energy company doing business throughout the Mid-Atlantic, Northeast, and Midwest. Um, he previously worked in the policy office for Governors Tim Kaine and Mark Warner prior to working in the governor's office. He was the vice president for policy at the Virginia Hospital Association and a senior staff member for the Virginia General Assembly. So please, you guys, join me in welcoming these panelists. So Lane and I were talking. We really do want this to kind of be a conversation, and we appreciate you know, lack of a six-foot table with a, a curtain in front. I said, yeah, they're going to set us up Oprah style. And usually right now, I'd ask all of you to reach under your chairs. <laughs> New cars for everybody, but um, I've got some questions which have been previously shared with this group, and what I'm going to do is ask those questions and give each of them an opportunity to respond with some, with some time, I think, for some interaction and conversations amongst the group. So um, what I'd like to do is, is really start with um, maybe the most important question <laughs> um, and ask each of you, you know, reflecting on your company's you know, really unique business needs. Um, what are the top skills your organization is looking for? And maybe you could present this as kind of entry, mid-level, uh, senior level, if, if those are, are ways that you kind of distinguish these skills. And why do you see them becoming more important kind of as you look forward to the future? Do you want me to start? Please. Um, I'm, I'm going to give a, uh, I should start by saying I'm Bill Murray and I don't work in human resources. <laughs> so I'm the one panel stuff here who's not a workforce professional. Uh, this will sound counterintuitive. The most important skill we look for at Dominion is what we'll call a 24-7 mentality. Uh, mercifully, last week, uh, we had a hurricane turn off the coast and head away from the east coast of Virginia. Uh, but the question is, if there's, there's never a question at Dominion, are we open? We're always open. 24-7, 365. A lot of places say that. Uh, the ones that mean it are public safety, hospitals, and, power, and utilities. Uh, we're always open. 
Most of our jobs don't require a college degree. About uh, three-fourths don't require a four-year degree. What they all require is a 24-7 mindset. And that is why, in particular, we've had great, uh, great luck hiring from the military because it's a very easy transition uh, to, uh, uh, from uh, something that even more so has, the, 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 if you can go beyond 24-7, which mathematically you can't, but attitudinally you can, <laughs> the military, uh, military goes beyond that. Uh, so that's our most important skill. The second most important skill is probably lifelong learning, and that really, it's true if you think about how the utility business has changed. It's true in terms of how energy is changing. The governor talked about some of that. So I won't uh, bore you with the details, and it's true as you progress throughout your career. Uh, frankly, we have executives who would be probably higher up in the organization if they'd taken a basic uh, public speaking class from one of Glenn Blue Wise colleges. Uh, we have people who, uh, some of our most talented people in the company who know the most about the operations of the company are on the craft or union side of the business uh, because frankly, uh, when the chips are down, when a storm has just caused major damage to the grid, a 45-year uh, veteran, a 45-year uh, tenured uh, veteran supervisor is a lot more valuable than a senior vice president in terms of how to rebuild the power grid. Uh, and that's something that uh, Really, the, uh, the, the community colleges now are talking about middle skills. That's an important concept. I'd even go further and call them critical skills. There's nothing middle skill about build, rebuilding the power grid right after a hurricane, running a, uh, running a nuclear plant properly right as it's being hit by an earthquake. Uh, we've had all of those things happen in the last few years. Uh, so those are sort of non-HR, more <laughs> policy wonky kind of answers, but that's really what we're looking for at the minute. Thank you. And Lane. Sure. Uh, you know, Capital One is a financial services institution, but you're going to hear me talk today about us, our transition into more of a technology and information. We've always been an information-based company, but uh, certainly pushing into that realm. I'd say we, we're looking for several things. Some of the stuff we've always looked for. So we're looking for people that are analytically minded, positive problem solving, um, that are really um, comfortable working in a consensus-based environment. Uh, and I think those are skills you build um, from early education on. Um, I will tell you as we make the transition into more of a technology and, and customer-based, customer-focused institution, uh, we're looking for coders, developers, software engineers, data scientists, um, you know, a lot of the field, fields that we heard a lot about this morning um, and that, quite frankly, most companies are looking for right now, um, they are in short demand. Um, so we need, or short supply, high demand, um, and we need to really focus in on how do we build that moving forward. Um, the last thing I'd say is we're really also looking for people who can think like our customers and work back to solve for whatever it is we need to solve for. Product design, you know, financial models behind that product design, whatever that looks like. But how do we actually help our customers build their own financial well-being um, and move back from that versus just selling them a checking account or a credit card? Thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, let me address it in a couple ways. One some of the skills that we're looking for on the salaried side of the population, plus we have seven manufacturing or processing facilities uh, that we hire a number of, with a few thousand hourly employees. On the salaried side, some of the same soft skills that uh, Lane and Bill were talking about, we look for as well. Uh, in addition, uh, as folks are moving through uh, college or high school, we look for what uh, what leadership accountabilities have they taken on? Have they taken on leadership in clubs or social uh, uh, social clubs or business-related clubs? But some of the more particular skills, some of the same ones that Lane was talking about, digital is becoming a bigger issue. Uh, you know, we're a consumer products company. It's how do you get more consumer-centric? Uh, and on the digital side, it's kind of in two places. You've got the the big data world, so how can you understand the, the mounds and mounds of data that is now available to better understand your consumers with uh, more consumers are using their smartphones or using uh, and are, they're tied into various trade outlets that provides a wealth of data, but unless you have the people who know how to mine that data and know how to get insights from that data, then the data is just, it's gobbledygook. So that's one of the critical areas that we're looking at now is how can you get people who are better facile with uh, taking big mounds of data and actually driving insights through that. But also, uh, same, similar to what Lane was talking about, how can you better understand the consumer experience from front to, front to end? There's a process called design thinking. Mm -hmm. UVA's got a school on it. Stanford has a wonderful school on it. Uh, and that really is about getting very consumer-focused 
and learning how to basically design for that consumer from the beginning to the end. Uh, we're really focusing a lot on that now, and I'd like to see more of that just taken out of the kind of the graduate schools mm -hmm. at the universities and taking more down to the, uh, the high school level and start to teach some of those skills there. Very quickly, on the hourly side, we are starting to see real shortages in the skilled trades, uh, electricians, plumbers, pipe fitters. Uh, the, the average age of that population continues to go up and there aren't a lot of people coming behind them. The, uh, the conference board did a study last year where they predicted, or, or are predicting, a 15-year period where we are going to have a very tight labor market across a number of different skills. But skilled trades was one of the critical ones because even though manufacturing may not be growing like some of the other areas, the folks who are filling those skilled trade jobs now will be leaving, and there's not a pipeline of people coming behind them. I thought that was interesting as you're all obviously in very different uh, businesses, but if I could kind of draw some boxes around some themes there, um, quite a bit around what I would consider, you know, employability skills or soft skills, uh, creative problem solving, you know, a good, a good work attitude and a commitment there. And then a couple big boxes in the technical skill space, it sounded like IT maybe a shared need, particularly on the end. Um, and then skilled trades and technicians, which is an, uh, an area where, you know, we've identified um, as an opportunity for Virginia as well. Does that accurately, you think, represent? Absolutely. Awesome. So understanding those two kind of really different, right, technical skills and then some of these that are just work habits, if you will, or, or attitudinal. What do you think education systems could be doing to better align with your future workforce needs? And maybe if any of you have examples of some ways that you've partnered actively with training providers to help build some of this into the curriculum, I'd love to learn about that. Assuming we're going in the same order again, I'll start. Well, no, actually, I'm going to start. Oh, don't, yeah, oh, don't. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, in terms of uh, education system, really a key linchpin, and I think Blueprint Virginia said this well, Barry's phrase that the community colleges are a core asset of state government, I think was very well put. Uh, and that's something we're making a major investment in because, as I said, most of our jobs don't require a uh, four-year degree, but they all require some kind of post-secondary uh, experience, credentials in some cases, but certainly post-secondary uh, education. The community colleges are a critical part of doing that. And I think generally thinking about a system, it's like any other sort of throughput process, you worry about your handoffs. So our kids kindergarten ready? And there's been a lot of talk and a lot of effort on that. Down the road, um, to be honest, and we see that here in the conversation in the Richmond area, that we've never quite landed the plane on middle school is a key mm -hmm. vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I'm biased on this. My beloved younger sister is a middle school assistant principal and has taught at middle school all, all, her, all her career. That's a critical handoff. High school readiness is a critical handoff. And kind of the unsolved or unanswered question of a generation of K-12 reform is how is that translated into college readiness or mm -hmm. post-secondary readiness, broadly speaking, not just, you know, are you ready for freshman comp, but are you ready for the workplace and being able to crosswalk that. I've taught as an adjunct for 25 years, I guess, academic day labor, as we call it. And the one thing I've noticed, in general, kids are better prepared as far as technology and soft skills go. Uh, I think anybody who's taught will probably agree writing has not benefited from a generation of, uh, maybe yes. we're doing better on math. We're not moving the needle on writing, and yeah. that's something that we've really got to uh, got to work on because that's a critical, critical workplace skill and again a key career derailer as all of us have colleagues if they were better writers would have more potential in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So that's some thoughts there but really those, those handoffs are critical. It's never too late and that's why the community colleges are great. The great thing about the United States we have second acts and third acts and fourth acts in careers. Martha Mead just told me she's retired for the second time. This is a country where you can do that and what enables that in a lot of cases the community colleges. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think there are a lot of things we need to focus on. We um, recently commissioned a study through Burning Glass, which is an analytics and research firm, and we asked them to analyze a year's worth of job descriptions in all of the major markets in which we operate, and we actually had them look at the entire state of Virginia, given the presence we have here. And one of the things that they came back with, which we weren't surprised by the results, we, I think we were a bit surprised by the, the sheer numbers, 78% of middle skill jobs require some level of digital proficiency. 
So this is not coding, this is not software engineering, these are not data scientists, these are our call center agents. These are our tellers. These are folks who have to be able to operate some level of system, and they exist in all of our businesses. Um, and I'm not sure our schools are preparing our students for that. Um, in, of those middle skill jobs, if you have those digital skills, you make on average 18% more than you do if you, you know, in, 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 a, in a different kind of uh, situation. And so, you know, it's really important that we focus in on how do we help our students learn that from a very early age. I don't teach in a middle school, but I have a middle schooler. Um, and, you know, watching her navigate that is, is, is really, I mean, it's, it is a focus of schools. I think we need to focus even earlier um, and with more effort. I think we need to help educate our educators. Um, I know at Capital One, we have focused a lot on the students. So we have several programs that we're running through. We have partnerships with universities at the university level where we fund research, we um, influence curriculum, we guest lecture. Um, we are focused with several non-for-profit um, uh, organizations around educating the workforce in digital literacy, financial literacy, and general job skills. Um, but I think the key also is we also are, have um, some, some um, pretty significant um, focus and volunteerism efforts in the middle schools, in all the communities in which we live and work, um, and in particular middle schools that tend to have less access to technology and digital skills than others. So it's, um, it's something we've all got to really focus on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of things. One, I want to echo what Bill was talking about, about writing skills. Mm -hmm. it, it is, we teach a effective business writing class to, people, to new well. employees, and it's basically remedial writing mm -hmm. uh, because it's the, and these are people who are coming out of college, mm -hmm. college graduates Graduate that school. are having trouble with nerve valve, or words, uh, words, words have to word, have a vowel right, to be uh, word. Passive voice. Uh, <laughs> writing just clear, crisp sentences, because especially in a consumer products company, if you can't articulate mm -hmm. your position, then you're gonna have trouble connecting to that consumer. So if we could work on, we've done a great job with STEM, but I think we have lagged behind on some of those, some of those writing skills. But I also wanna echo on what Bill was talking about, about the middle school focus. Altria has, for a number of years, had a program called Success 360, which is focused on the, uh, the middle school years, which can be among the toughest years. If you can save the students during that middle school years, they're going to have a much higher chance of success in, in high school and beyond. Uh, we sponsor communities and schools, big brothers, big sisters, and the one that's near and dear to my heart, Higher Achievement, uh, which is focused on it's a very intensive after-school academic uh, enrichment program mm -hmm. that it just has wonderful results. And I, I think by focusing on those middle school years and keeping the scholars, as we call them at higher achievement, not students, but scholars, engaged and not just focused on their academics, but focused on their futures, on their careers, what they want to be, it really kind of engages them for high school, which engages them for college, which engages them and makes them a much more uh, useful applicant when they come to us. Yeah, and I think these, these examples of commitments of bringing your associates into these, into these schools, for example, these academic environments is an incredible resource. Bringing real world business skills and experiences into the schools is wonderful. I really liked your analogy of this handoff, and I was envisioning this, this workforce system as a, a relay team, if you will, um, and thinking about how from early childhood, and to do that, we've all got to be kind of running at pace, right, um, and paying attention to those transitions. I think that's a really important message um, for a lot of us um, here in the audience. Um, one of you know my board's big focus, and certainly the governor's kind of set this out as a goal for the workforce system, um, as we look towards common performance measures moving forward. Um, all of us working towards some shared goals. Um, business engagement is one of them. Um, and so what are some ways that you guys can envision um, partnering in new and different ways in the future with the, the education system or the workforce development training system. I'll, I'll distinguish those two a little bit if that's helpful. And maybe we could start on the end this time. Uh, the chancellor of the Virginia Community College System, I think he just completed a series of kind of listening sessions did, yeah. around the state where he invited uh, both members of the business community, educators, 
uh, government to come and actually talk about those issues and what are the what are the looming skill gaps so I think that's one way that especially the community college system that uh, can do better I think one thing on the on the employer side from the business community traditionally I think we have been pretty good at projecting here are the skills that we think we are going to need over the next one three maybe five years out but really if, if you're talking about investing in pre-k and elementary school and even middle school you're talking 10 to 15 year out uh, projections that's sometimes hard to do but if you're talking about kind of changing the focus of an educational system we do need to from a business standpoint the business community needs to get better at forecasting longer term versus just one three and five years out because if I'm forecasting three years out I'm talking about a college freshman right now I'm not talking about somebody who's in fourth grade right uh, so I, I completely agree. Um, I think we need to um, focus, we need to do a better job of, of articulating what we need in, in a much longer horizon. I also think we need to have a much closer alignment with curriculum development, with, um, you know, kind of what are the goals and what do we want, what do we want our students to graduate with versus just graduating with a piece of paper? What are the skills, um, what, is the, what is their path forward once they leave our secondary education system? And that can look different and, and it can take many paths, but um, I think we've got to figure out how do we actually build tools that allow us to assess um, what we need in the, com in the business community, how that is then getting translated through the system. Because um, I'm not sure that those connections are being made, back to the handoff analogy. Um, so it, it's, it's, um, it's got to start, the theme of the day has been it's got to start earlier. Right. Um, our job is to do a better job of giving the school systems what they need. I think the school systems also need to be able to pivot way more nimbly than they can today. Uh, and that's a big shift to turn, I understand. Um, but you know, the, by the time we put something in the system from a curriculum development perspective, it's several years before it starts to play through. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the economy is shifting way too fast for that. Um, and we're gonna see, we're gonna continue to lag in the skills we need in the workforce going forward if we can't figure out how to create a different way to, to operate. That, I think that's an important observation. Do you add anything else? Uh, what I would just add is thinking about there has been a little bit of tendency in the United States to waste human potential, whether it's with our correctional policies, whether it's if you haven't taken algebra by the seventh grade or the eighth grade, forget about a STEM career. Uh, if you haven't, you know, if you're not what I call, my daughter used to call the perfect kids in high school where you've got a, a GPA higher than perfect, which is mathematically, I'm sorry, not possible. I know we ever wait AP classes, but you know, it's like Nigel and Spinal Tap, the simplifier is better, it goes to 11. But be that, be that as it may, we've had a tendency to waste human potential. We're competing with states, Florida, California, and Texas, with three and four times our population, and nations, India and China with 125 times our population. The last thing Virginia can afford to do is waste anybody's human potential. And the great thing, we're wrong about the, it's got to be, you know, you've got to take algebra by the time you can walk. Sure, that's great for some of the kids. It's never too late. You can take algebra at age 30 and you can still have a reasonably, uh, not reasonably, you can have a great career right. in STEM uh, fields. It is never too late, even if you've had a brush with the law, if you've not been a perfect kid, if you've dropped out, that's why middle college, something that Chancellor Dubois worked on years ago was a great concept. It is never too late. And so on behalf of my fellow late bloomers, uh, I like what George Bush said at SMU graduation this year. He said to the A students, congratulations to the C students, you too can be president. <laughs> <laughs> well, as someone who took, I think, business algebra when I was almost 30, yeah. I can certainly attest to those kinds of opportunities. Uh, Sarah, can I just add something to what Please. Bill just said? Uh, about the late bloomers and providing that, those opportunities for people who may be beyond college. That the same conference board report that I referred to a minute ago projected that over the next 15 years, Virginia's uh, working age population is actually expected to slightly decline. Uh, and it's because the folks who are leaving the workforce outnumber the folks who are aged 3 to 17 right now. Now, fortunately, as the governor said, we live in a wonderful state where people like to move. So with migration and immigration, uh, that workforce will actually grow. But with migration and immigration, you're getting folks who probably are beyond pre-K, middle school. They, they may be people who are already in the workforce. 
So I think there is maybe that gap there, and Bill touched on it. Is there something that we need to be thinking about how the people who are moving to the state, uh, do they have the skills that we need, or is there a way that we can provide them with the skills, given the fact that our existing work, uh, work in age population is expected to decline over the next 15 years? I think that's a really important point, too, and we spend a lot of time, we talk about Virginia like it's this kind of uniform, right, everything is equal, but there are many Virginians, I, I like to say, and so some of the experiences that, that's happening in the labor market here in Richmond, for example, are much different than what's being experienced in Southwest, so that's something we also have to react and respond to um, on a regional level um, as well. Um, you guys had mentioned some partnerships that you've formed. Um, how do you measure the success of those initiatives? Um, or or do, you, do you have success measures? Is, is just being there enough? And maybe, Lane, maybe you could start there. Sure. We have, um, we have some longstanding partnerships. We also have some pretty new partnerships. We've launched a five-year um, program called Future Edge, um, in which we have, uh, are going to be putting $150 million into um, digital and financial literacy, skill, literacy skills across um, the, our communities in which we live and work. Um, and that has resulted in several new partnerships. Um, one of them is with Grovo. Um, and part of, I think, the theme here is I think we also need to look at some, potentially some places to provide education and certification that, haven't, that are new. Mm -hmm. As the economy continues to develop, then that maybe are somewhat non-traditional. Um, so Grovo is, uh, we've built an online financial literacy curriculum um, that anybody here can go check out if you'd like. Uh, but really targeting a lot of the communities, um, underserved communities and then in our footprint. Um, we have launched a um, coding fellowships program with General Assembly. Uh, so we, li we literally just graduated 30 fellows, and a lot of them are our second career, third career. You know, we're going to take a different turn here. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually had the chance to meet one of them Friday night at one of the events in, uh, in our corporate headquarters. And, you know, she's who we talk about. She was, you know, underemployed, single parent, and she now she's now coding. Um, and she's got a great career ahead of her. So I think there are a lot of things like that we need to take a look at. Some of our longer standing partnerships, um, when we look at how we evaluate them, part of what we look at is are we building skill and employment employability across the communities we are in, regardless of whether they come to work at Capital One or not. Mm -hmm. um, so part of, I think, what we've got to do, in particular in the STEM world, but also with you know, the, what you know, Governor said, one in four. right? One in four is who we're talking about. What do we do for the other three? Um, I think what we're trying to do for, for a lot of those other three is create a different path for them through a lot of the partnerships. And so we look at employment rates. We look at people who were underemployed or unemployed and have been through one of our programs and are now have a job, whether it is our job or not. Um, obviously, we would love for them to come work for us. We have 4,000 open roles right now. Um, but we, uh, but you know, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're serving those communities and kind of building the collective skill. Fantastic, Bill. Uh, I think thinking about how the company gets involved, it's sort of three buckets. First, what the company itself invests in, and a good example I've already mentioned is investing in the community college system and their vision of uh, sort of closing the skills gap and what I'll call, what I've renamed in my own mind, sort of the essential or critical skills, the middle skills uh, that folks talk about. The second is what our employees and what our officers put their time into. Good example of that, uh, some of our senior leadership, uh, Mr. Coons, for example, are very heavily invested in what Kathy Glazer is working on at the Early Childhood Foundation, uh, as well as the Go Virginia initiative uh, with the idea, and that builds exactly on, on what my colleague from Capital One just said of sort of Virginia as a series of regional economies, and, which, and Sarah, what you led off uh, by saying, it's a series of regional uh, economies that needs regional initiatives. And then there's what we try to jumpstart ourselves versus joining an existing effort an example there was troops to energy and getting the energy industry focused on hiring veterans. But I will say we often think of what the company does is the most important. To my mind, I would say that's backwards. It's more, I think we, we speak loudest with what our employees actually put their time and resources into. Great. Yeah, a uh, couple things on, how, on measurement itself. First, I'll talk about kind of some of our college relationships that we have. We recruited 20 different colleges uh, around the country for both their jobs here and their jobs in the sales force around the country. And we have what we call it the Leadership Investment Fund, where we make investments at each of those colleges. And one of the ways we measure the results of that is what are the students that we're getting? Are we getting a good return? Are we uh, 
having success getting good quality applicants. And then when they come to us, how are they doing once they get there? Are they getting promoted at a certain rate? So that has a lot of metrics around uh, that particular investment. The other investment, the one I talked about earlier, the Success 360, the investing in the middle schools, especially here in Richmond, we've been at it for a little while, but the, the more recent kind of heavier investment, especially around higher achievement, uh, just started four years ago. And so the most recent graduates out of that program are just now freshmen and sophomores uh, in high school. But higher achievement has a number of metrics around uh, how many are maintaining AA to B, how, how are their attendance, uh, at least here in Richmond. The national program actually has some great statistics around uh, college graduation rates for inner city middle school students and how many are going to competitive high schools. So there's lots of really great metrics around that program that, uh, that we would look at pretty closely. And I think these are three really great, very different examples, right, of how these three companies have chose to evaluate their investment. I think I heard here, you know, you're directing your associates to get involved in the things that are part of, you know, your, col your corporate culture, the things that you think are really important. Here we're standing up initiatives and driving skills development in areas where there's a noted gap. D digital literacy, I think, is an area where there's been some mark. And then in your example, um, investing directly in the college space, the higher ed space, which is a much different example and being able to actually calculate a, perhaps a financial return to your company. Um, so I think it just shows the diverse interaction, right, that can take place and, and companies here might want to think about a little bit. Um, we touched on regional thinking. I want to make sure we have time to talk about that. What do you think we could do here in Virginia to elevate regional thinking, planning, and doing around uh, workforce development uh, in your minds. And, and uh, you know, we'd love to kind of hear some ideas. Jeremy, we'll start here with you, Bill. Uh, that tees up uh, Go Virginia pretty well <laughs> because, I, as I understand, the whole point of that uh, is you provide incentives to act regionally and not just at the jurisdiction level. Uh, the, we have the system of local government we have. It's one only Virginia's chosen to have. It is what it is, independent cities, separate counties. But the way you, you overcome that is you act regionally. And we've had examples in the past where a state says, we don't want this particular service delivered at a local level. We want it delivered at a regional level and sort of growing that thinking in terms of uh, workforce and education and, and things of this nature. Uh, the, great, the great thing is, uh, yes, we talked to the governor, talked a lot about the challenges of the, the wind down and, and sort of the federal defense spending from the global war on terror. That's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. And it's an opportunity to wean ourselves off being a one industry state. Right. Uh, we're going to always, just as there will always be in England, there's always going to be a substantial US military commitment. But there are so many opportunities, whether it's, uh, the governor mentioned new energy, whether it's in data analytics, whether it's in energy storage, which is a huge untapped frontier, whether it's cybersecurity, there's so much opportunity. We have so much human potential coming out of all levels of education. Uh, and every region of the state's got the opportunity to seize on that. There was a time at the turn of the last century when Southwest Virginia had more millionaires than any other part of the state. So there's something every, in the digital economy, every part of the state uh, can play in these new industries. And that's something, it's about time we got to work on that. And that's why I'm glad Go Virginia's focused on it. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, sure. I, I think a lot of it is um, coming up with a set of common goals. Um, and, and, a, and a very small number of them um, that everybody's willing to work against. I was, uh, was, had the pleasure of attending a workforce development event in Northern Virginia a couple weeks ago, and I found myself in this small group conversation about kind of the definition of Northern Virginia. And I was the only person in that group that, wasn't, that didn't live in Northern Virginia. I'm here, Richmond-based. And I just said, hey, just so y'all are aware, you know, for those of us who don't live up here, we think anything north of Fredericksburg is North Virginia, right? <laughs> Correct. You know, you hit that second exit, right? Yes, the second exit the of 25, Fredericksburg yeah. exit, then you're in Northern Virginia. And, you know, Stafford County was not even represented in the conversation. And so part of it is what are you working back from, right? So, you know, they were kind of having, and it was a great discussion, but it was kind of, hey, like, as someone who's a, who's a bit of an outsider in this discussion, I have a completely different view of Northern Virginia than what you guys are talking about. So who is your target audience? What are you working back from? What are the two or three goals that we're gonna go after? Because not surprisingly, we were all over the map because there's a ton of work that needs to be done in a bunch of different places, um, but you're never gonna actually get regional commitment for 15 goals. You need to get regional commitment for one, two, maybe three, 
and then determine what it is you're trying to accomplish and how do you work back from that. And your thoughts on, on regions and organizing workforce resources? Yeah, I'll give an example of uh, something that I think has worked pretty well, but also has greater potential to work even better. It's the Community College Workforce Alliance mm -hmm. between John Tyler and Jay Sarge. Uh, they combine forces. They've got resources behind it. They work with local businesses to, to do answer a lot of the same questions that we're talking about today and you know put together community college level programs that you can either send your folks to or they will actually come on site and help train. But that type of kind of regional cooperation between the community colleges and then they bring the businesses into that conversation, I think is a good model that can work. Uh, I think it has a lot more potential though. I think that's a great example too about how two institutions can kind of combine assets and resources to, to solve a regional um, need. I will tell you since I, I joined the team, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about regions and at the state level looking at how many, you know, we talk about workforce areas, for example, how many of you are familiar with that regional definition, um, local workforce areas, some hands, mostly on the system <laughs> side, exactly. So there's actually 36 at least that I could find um, different regional definitions and configurations. So. Um, it's important for you in, in positions of business leadership to kind of keep that in mind when we think about organizing resources while intuitively region makes sense. We're thinking about 37 at least different things. And so helping us bring focus um, to some of that I think is going to be really, really helpful. Um, thinking about the future a little bit. Um, Lane, I think you touched on it on just... I don't know, one of you touched on it, about really needing to be able to think further into the future. Mark, maybe you touched on that too, a little bit about how you do workforce planning. And then also I'm really interested in this idea of, of signaling um, skill requirements, for example, because that's something I think on the workforce system side, we're looking for those, those lighted beacons, if you will, so that we can start building some of these systems. But when you think out into the future, maybe just in those two domains, um, demand planning on your, on your behalf and how you can start thinking about skill needs for the future, what do you see your organizations doing or maybe what would you like to see your organizations doing? Let's start with any of you that, that may have a thought there. What? I, I, so no, go, ahead. go ahead. One of the things that we've been doing uh, especially since this, I keep mentioning this conference board report that came out uh, last year, uh, I think it was uh, not enough, from not enough jobs to not enough workers. Mm -hmm. And it was talking about the coming labor shortage because of the, the generational gaps, the boomers retiring, not enough Gen X and uh, to some extent Gen Y coming in behind. So we've actually spent the last prop almost year looking at some of the uh, implications from that report because it actually has it breaks it down in very much detail uh, uh, by job code job classification right. the expected labor's tightness for each job classification over the next 15 years and so we're starting to match some of that stuff up with what we expect some of our needs to be and we talked about a lot of them earlier yeah. And, okay, if, knowing that we're going to have trouble hiring electricians five years from now, ten years from now, or digital marketers, five, even today we're having trouble with digital marketers, what are some things that we can start doing? Where are the schools we need to go to? What are the investments we need to make to help get those people 15 years from now who may right. be in fifth grade today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's an important observation. It's a bit very similar. I think we, um, you know, the White House issued a report that by the year 2020, we will have um, a, a million person shortage in STEM fields for the jobs we have in the United States. We will fill those jobs somehow, may or may not be with American workers. Mm. Um, so a lot of it is how do we actually start in the fifth grade? Um, and it is, and you know, this, the actual technologies will shift over time, so I think a big part of what we need to build is also, and I think, Bill, you mentioned it, what we call learning agility. Mm -hmm. um, lifelong learning, you can call it a whole host of things, but, you know, if you have a technology mind, if you have a digital mind, if you have, you know, if you love information, um, the actual things you will use to, in, in your, in the, the tools you'll use in your craft will shift quickly, um, but you need that orientation. Uh, so how do we actually build that early on? And again, I think the important message is it's not just the software engineers. 
you know, 78% of middle skill jobs require digital skills. And so how do we ensure that, I mean, I would imagine most of the jobs in all of our companies require some level of ability to, you know, kind of operate an Excel spreadsheet, navigate through a system, whatever that is. Right. How do we actually make sure that our workforce has that going forward? That's never going to shift. And Bill, I apologize. I've been told I really need to do this lightning round. I've talked enough. <laughs> I've got my yellow light. I've got my yellow light. Yeah. So this is this is really an important question because this gets to, you know, hi, I'm with the government and how can we help, right? Hi, I'm with the business community. How can we help? What actions do you think could be taken at the state or federal level that would make the most meaningful difference when you guys think about the skills gap that's affecting your particular business? Uh, most meaningful, better handoffs, starting at pre-K uh, and going all the way through to graduate school. Better handoffs from each level into the workplace for the next level. And realize it's a loop. It's not a, it's not a train going one place. It's a loop that lasts all throughout life. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think ensuring every student that comes out of high school has a path forward, be it trade school, be it a kickstart program, be it community college, a four-year degree, vocational training, internship. Like I said, you can take a ton of different paths, but they need to get out with more than just the piece of paper. They yeah. need to get out with what's, what's their next step to build a meaningful career. Right. I, I echo both of those. Uh, I, I will add, at the federal level, I, I think we do need to address immigration reform, uh, given, this, given the tightness of the market that we see coming, the, just because of the number of boomers going out, not enough people coming behind them. We're, we're going to need talented, uh, people who are not born in this country uh, to fill some of those jobs. I think that's an important addition. It hasn't been a part of our discussion, but I do think that's perhaps one solution in some of these areas. So that's the end of our time, right on time. So why don't you guys join me in thanking the panelists.